from WXXI News. This is Connections. I'm Evan Dawson. Our connection this hour was made a year and a half ago in Penfield when town residents took on a project to help mitigate the effects of climate change. The Penfield CCA Residence Committee has been working toward bringing something called Community Choice Aggregation, CCA, to their town. If you're not familiar with CCA, the brief summary is that it can allow a town or a group of towns to choose an electricity supplier on behalf of residents and then use that collective power to negotiate the rates. The CCA was first implemented in Massachusetts more than two decades ago. Since then, it has been implemented in communities across the country, including some in Monroe County. 2018 saw Irondequoit, Brighton, Pittsford passing local laws and signing a joint agreement to pursue CCA, Community Choice Aggregation. The Penn Field Town Board could vote on the CCA proposal soon, and members of the CCA committee are hoping it will pass and cite the positive steps the board has already taken to reduce the town's carbon footprint. This hour, we find out why they want this. We explore what community choice aggregation is and the tangible effects it can have on communities, and I'd like to welcome our guests. Alan Hibner is here. Al is lead for the Penfield CCA Residence Committee and a member of the Citizens Climate Lobby. Al, welcome back to the program. Thank you for having us, Evan. And hello to Megan Meyer, who is co-lead for the Penfield CCA Residence Committee. Thanks for being here. Thanks. And also with us is Ben Frevert, who is a volunteer at the Rochester People's Climate Coalition and the founder and owner of Rocktricity. Welcome back. Tell our listeners again, Ben, what Rocktricity is. Uh, Rocktricity um, was born out of an effort at the RPCC uh, to address um, CCA, to try to help promote and advocate for community choice aggregation in uh, in Monroe County and, and beyond, in the sort of the greater Rochester and, and into the Finger Lakes area, uh, because of our concern about climate change and the the possibility that uh, community choice aggregation can can help. I'm here to help <clears throat> you with the branding of CCA. We need to come up with a sexier name. CCA should be exciting as a concept for people. Community choice aggregation tends to make people's eyes glaze over. Listeners, I promise you, this is going to be more exciting than you expect, given the name. What's a sexier name, Ben, than CCA? Oh, uh, I, I'm not sure I'm going to be. I'm not the guy. I'm an engineer. I, I You're don't not a marketer. This, I'm, not, I'm not the guy that You're comes up with sexier names. No. Community but that, choice but aggregation. But that came out of the public service commission, so it's yes. just what you would expect. It is it what you would expect. And for Al, come on. Come well, here. what is it? So far, the best we've done is just to bring it to the initials CCA as a, as a branding, and uh, we don't have an alternative name for it yet at this point. <laughs> I wish we did. I wish we did. You are absolutely right. All right. Well, we're going to see if Megan Meyer's got an idea. What do you oh, got, Megan? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. It is one How of those. How about New Energy Destiny? <laughs> <laughs> like we can have like a movie trailer and someone's like, I'll put on my like super radio, like New Energy Destiny. <laughs> it's it just, I understand that it's sometimes a little bit of a wonky name, but this is important. And I want to go back 18 months because Al, this has been a year and a half in the making. It's not a done deal in Penfield. Ben can tell us what's been happening in other places, but why did you decide a year and a half ago to go after this? Well, uh, about a year and a half ago, I was on your show in relationship to Drawdown, Project Drawdown and Pachamama Alliance, yep. and I'd uh, taken a course from them, and one of the things you do is, is develop an individual project out of that course. My project happened to be, I wanted to work on implementing uh, CCA, Community Choice Aggregation in Penfield, because working at the local level, the municipal level, is where you can have a great effect. So I chose it as my project, I heard there were a couple other people that wanted to do it, and we formed a committee, and we're about 14 strong now, and have had numerous meetings throughout the past year and a half and presentations, and we're making wonderful progress toward this goal. So it was really a personal project for me to be involved in taking action, it's doing something about climate change and solving it. I know that it, this is something that, that is complex, and it's not the kind of thing that in five seconds you can immediately explain, but it is important to be able to communicate with people pretty quickly about what you're talking about. Let me ask all three of you. When people say, CCA, don't know what it is, how do you start, Al? What is it? Well, my basically, uh, the electrical portion of my bill is, is going to be... Uh, hopefully kept at, at, a, at a good, stable price while the fossil fuel portion goes up. So I'll be able to make choices about switching to electrical devices in my home and life, my car, my heating. Uh, it's going to affect me personally because I'll be able to avoid uh, rises in energy generated from fossil fuels. That's my goal. That's what I think will happen for me. Okay. Megan, what is community choice aggregation? Well, um, I see it as um, an opportunity to um, bulk buy as a community so that we can lower those electric rates, but also 
We are advocating for 100% renew renewable energy, um, which I think is very important with uh, the climate crisis that we're in right now. Okay. Ben Frevert, what is it? How does it work? Well, I'll try to keep it as brief as I can. Sure. Um, uh, it is a policy put in place by the state through the Public Service Commission back in uh, March of 2016, and it allows municipalities to aggregate all of the uh, uh, energy usage in the community and go to the market and try to uh, pursue a, a better price and other terms for contracts to meet that demand. Um, there's a lot in the language of the CCA order that explains uh, that the, the goal really is to, to move toward renewable energy. M municipalities aren't bound to go after mu renewable energy, uh, but they're, they're very much encouraged to in the CCA order. Uh, at Rocktricity, we're focused on working with those communities that do want to move toward renewable energy. So beyond just a municipality aggregating the usage in their community, they can work with other towns and villages and cities and aggregate even further. And you can see as that grows, if you take that level of supply to the supply market and try to pursue terms for contracts, better pricing, 100% um, renewable, and other terms that are favorable to customers, as opposed to there are many traditional ESCO contracts that are not nearly as favorable to customers, some that offer a teaser rate and then go up. These contracts rather will be will be written in favor of the customers and then we'll go to the ESCO community and have them uh, bid on whether or not they want to provide that supply. And it can be a lot of supply. So we're, we're going to be able to get the attention of the supply markets as we aggregate uh, more communities. So I see it as a means for, for those communities, those municipalities that are concerned about renewable energy to bring renewable, uh, renewable electricity to a lot of uh, folks in their communities. Most customers don't care. Most customers don't care wh where their electricity is coming from. And the pennies and uh, of difference in price, they often don't care about that either. What we've discovered and what we've discovered in other places in the country is that people get their, most people get their electric bill and they open it and they see how much they owe and they send it in. And, and, and they just don't have time to, to go beyond that. Some people do. Some people are, are seeking ESCO supplied electricity that's renewable already. And in many cases, they're paying more for it. With CCA, we think we can get those people that don't care in particular, and there's a lot of them, to use 100% renewably generated electricity and, and save a little bit of money at the same time. See, so that to me is sort of the the double benefit that seems when people hear it, they might say, well, the old trope is that renewable would cost more. So what are the forms of renewable we're talking I'm going to start with you, Ben. We'll ask all of you. What are the forms of renewable we're talking about if it's not fossil fuels? And what about that old trope that it would cost more, not less? So um, the forms of renewable we're talking about are wind, solar, hydroelectric. Um, we don't actually care all that much. We go to the market and it has to be certified renewable. So New York has a system for tracking renewables. Um, I'm not going to remember this, ac this acronym entirely. It's the NIGATS, but it's a state system for tracking renewables. And that's so that, that uh, credits generated by renewable generation don't get sold twice, right? It's to, it's to, keep, the, it's to keep the bad actors from, uh, from gaming that system. Um, so uh, those are the types of renewables, and that's how we're tracking it to make sure that it is, in fact, um, uh, renewable. As far as the old trope goes, well, it was true. You know, for a long time, uh, building uh, renewable generation cost more than building uh, coal and gas fired power plants. Uh, and then, of course, gas, natural gas was cheaper to build than coal and is now. But Solar has been gaining, since I've been involved with, with solar energy, which is coming on 10 years now, um, it has dropped. The price of putting new solar in place continues to drop, and I, I, I thought it would level out. It continues to drop today, um, and it, it's, it's, it's fascinating to see that, but it's really good. And so in many places in the country, if not all, um, building new generation that's wind or solar is cheaper than building new um, new natural gas generation. Okay, Al, in Penfield then, this is where you want this to happen. What's the timeline? Al and Megan, give us an, an update in your town. And the reason, if this sounds like sort of parochial or esoteric, this every community in the country could eventually be making these kind of conversations, having these kind of conversations. This is a story this hour of what's happening in Penfield, but it's also happening in Pittsford, around Decoit, Brighton. It could happen everywhere. And this is, should be instructive as to what's 
the process is going to look like. So where are things in Penfield? If, if the law is passed, or the enabling law that says we can go forward th with this in uh, March, say March 18th would be the earliest, uh, then we would hope we would go out to request for proposals to find an administrator who would administer our program, another couple of months, um, and then they would be sending out uh, quotations or requesting quotations for contract for supply. So I would hope that we could be up and running by the end of this year. I think that would be a, a reasonable goal by the end of With what source of energy? Um, bottom line, we're hoping that the 30% of electricity currently that in our mix from fossil fuels would be replaced with renewable wind and solar as as uh, Ben has mentioned, 30% is also coming from nuclear. Now, that's carbon-free. That Not a lot of people think about that, but that has a zero impact on CO2 emissions at this point. So we're looking to replace the 30% of our electricity coming from fossil fuels with renewable. That's what we want. M Megan, what are you hearing in the town? What's the expectation? Um, we have, we just had a public hearing um, on March 4th, and uh, we had overwhelming um, approval of the town moving forward with it, and everybody who spoke were very concerned about uh, the climate impacts and also that they wanted 100% carbon-free renewable energy source, and they also were uh, talking about a community solar opt-up choice for those town residents who would like to um, to have that. If if everyone's in, in favor, though, I don't... Where's the controversy? Make the case here against this, Megan. What's, who's making the case against this? Um, well, as Ben said, a lot of people, and again, because the, the term is not sexy, a lot of people just don't even know and zone out that's about what it is. That's different, though, than actively opposing it. Who well, actively opposes this? Um, <laughs> Very few. We, we so, <laughs> so there's one. There is one. One thing that we run into in in making presentations to municipalities about what CCA is and why we should, they should move forward, and we think it's a no brainer too. But there, there's a there's one thing that comes up frequently, and it is, it is in a feeling expressed that um, putting CCA in place is Big Brother is mm -hmm. is the municipality mm -hmm. telling residents who they have to get their supply from. Now we usually we usually try to pause the pause the conversation right there and say, well, uh, let's let's compare that with what's happening right now. And right now, without CCA in place, uh, state law says that if you if you move into a, a new apartment or a new house and you call up RG&E and you say, I would, I would really like to have the lights on here at my house, can you make that happen? First of all, RG&E can't say no. So they, they turn the electricity on. And if you don't say anything more about who you want to get your supplier supply from, your default supplier is RG&E. If, on the other hand, you want a different supplier, you're free to make that selection. You can call the energy supply companies and, and, and switch, right? So that's the dynamic right now. With CCA in place, all we're doing is changing who, the, who selects the default. Instead of the state saying it's the utility, it is the local municipality, your municipality, saying mm -hmm. we're going to go shopping and find the supplier that meets our needs. But it isn't going to be fossil fuels. Well, they could do it with fossil fuels. Now, at Rocktricity, we have said we're not working with those communities because there's a, there's a downside to that for sure. But um, they can say, and most of the ones we're working with do say, we want to see at least a little bit better price than the previous 12 months from the utility, and we want 100% renewably generated electricity that's, that has – uh, that is certified renewable. And, and so um, it, part of it is getting in front of that concern that Big Brother's telling me who I have to buy my electricity from. Okay, fair uh, enough. Yeah, go ahead, Al. I agree. The, I agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. And Penfield's dynamic is a little bit different. Uh, this is a community that uh, has supported being fiscally responsible, having lower prices, but also being environmentally sustainable. And those two goals have been uh, – apparent in almost everything it's done with its Environmental Sustainability Committee and the uh, installation of a five-acre solar array to provide power for all of the town facilities. This is a town that's really shown uh, that it, it can do this and, and it can maintain both goals, fiscal responsibility as well as green energy and sustainability. I've got the new term, by the way. I've got it. It's simple. Community energy choice. Why not just that? I like it. I like Aggr it. Yeah. Right to the PSC. Aggregation is, is, is where people go, what? <laughs> and you put energy 
in the tr- in the title, community energy choice. We're okay. talking about community energy choice or CCA right. or community choice aggregation. Listeners, if you've got questions or comments, and I'll take a few in a moment here, but you can call the program. It's toll free, 844-295-TALK. 844-295-8255, 263-WXXI if you're in Rochester, 263-9994. You can email the program, connections at wxxi.org. Here's Kevin Schulte from GreenSpark Solar. He wants to challenge our guests. You ready? Ben, you're smiling. Uh, well, we, we know Kevin, right? Uh, Everybody knows yes, Kevin. Kevin yeah. Here, here's, what he <laughs> says. here's what he says. All right, Evan, challenge your guests. Why not put a renewable energy mandate in the CCA law, more importantly, local renewables. Remember that wind and solar are the fastest growing forms of employment in the country and the fastest growing energy sources on earth. If not required as a portion of the CCA, you can go buy renewable energy credits from a 12-year Wyoming wind farm, which does not help Rochester join the clean energy revolution and take advantage of these economic opportunities. I love the work of Rocktricity and the RPCC, but I challenge them in all of our communities to truly do something about climate and the economic transition available from new forms of energy. Make CCA mandate local renewables and 100% renewable from inside New York State. Ben? Well, I, yeah, I, I like Kevin's uh, sentiment there. Uh, that's something that would have to take place at the Public Service Commission, and, and uh, I, I think that's a wonderful idea. I, um, at Rocktricity and RPCC, you know, we're very much trying to work, uh, work on a local and regional level. Um, uh, Maybe when we when we get a little less busy, we can talk about. It. And Evan, Go ahead, this is this is what this committee is all about. This is democracy in action. We are lobbying for those exact same choices that he just mentioned. It's what we do as a committee. This is so he's not wrong. Responsibility. He's not wrong. No, and to dovetail on that, as another option in our program should be community solar opt up, which would guarantee uh, savings of eight to ten percent below the default RGE rates. So we're not mandating it in the legislation. We're saying we want that as community residents. This is we're lobbying for those two positions. Okay, Megan. I agree with that. Um, I think it's very important to um, uh, think about our, our climate and um, our future generations and how we um, live and work um, and and um, what kinds of power we choose. So um, I agree with Al there that um, we really are lobbying for the 100% renewable and uh, the community solar opt-up. Right. And the focus is to lobby our board, not to lobby the PSC to change the law, as he's advocating in his email there. We're lobbying our local community board members to do this for us. Well, can you do both? Yes, we're, we can do both. We can say we want 100% renewables as our default choice, and we want opt-up to solar that will be locally uh, sourced, and it will create jobs in, and move the economy up. It's got to be within the RG need service territory. That's going to increase jobs and uh, boost the economy. That's a good thing. So Kevin and Megan Schulte are somehow there everywhere all at the same time, and they never miss connections. So I'm sure they're listening, and they will follow up if we <laughs> if we have anything else we should address with that. Uh, here's Dan, who's got a, a term for you. He says, call it power to the people. That might be trademarked, but I like that better than community <laughs> choice. I like it better than community choice <laughs> aggregation. <laughs> Kevin says, please ask your guests, uh, different Kevin, by the way, uh, says, please ask your guests to address the question of ownership of the renewable energy credits that are generated by renewable projects such as solar farms. It seems that if the renewable energy credits are transferred to RG&E, then the solar merely displaces other renewables that, are, uh, that RG&E is required to purchase. That makes sense to you, Ben. Yeah, that's a little bit of a sticky issue. So um, uh, the, the, the credits, when they're generated through the CCA, it's my understanding those go to the ESCO. Those are, those are retired uh, again, at the ESCO. Again, explain the ESCO. What's that's an ESCO? The, that's the, whoever the su- selected supplier is, whoever the municipality selects as the supplier. In, in, the, in the negotiation contracting process to, to get supply to meet the aggregated demand. Um, those are retired at the, at the ESCO is my understanding. Um, now we've touched on community solar a little bit, but we haven't really um, taken the deep dive as to explain what that is. But in that case, the, it's my understanding that the, the credits are retired with the utility. And I think the concern being expressed is that um, if they're retired at the utility, they're simply displacing credits that the utility's already required 
to, to, to purchase, right? They're required to purchase, um, purchase credits, and then that electricity simply goes into the grid and gets sold at, at, their, at their retail rates. Um, and there's there's some there is some uh, some truth to that issue. If we if we are able to push um, renewable energy in a CCA format to the point where there's more being demanded than the uh, utilities are required to provide, then we're pushing beyond what the what the utilities um, have to purchase anyway. Now the utilities also have been to some degree have been resistant to that that um, requirement. So this should ease some measure of burden on the utilities to the extent that we care about that, I guess. We should sit down with rg and &E, have them join you here. I'm sure they'd have a lot to say. The, they do. They do. <laughs> they, they do. They have been in some, some of our discussions with municipalities about, about CCA, and uh, they certainly, um, they certainly um, talk as if they care a lot about renewable energy. Um, that's about all I'll say. At that. Okay. Uh, some uh, common questions here. If, if CCA, if community choice aggregation, if community energy choice is adopted, do residents have to install solar panels? They do not. No. No. They do not. In and fact, they don't just, really just have the to opposite. take. They don't have. They have to take no action whatsoever. And I can't. I have trees covering my house. I cannot install solar panels. So having CCA is a way for me to get solar energy on my build. And and this might be a good segue to talk a little bit about community solar. I don't know yeah, if you're ready for it. that. Yeah, but, yeah, let's do it. But there are a lot of people who uh, who would like to install solar. I have solar at my house because I have a sunny. A sun, there's part of my roof that's sunny, and so that's good. But not everybody has that luxury. They might not have a good sun on their house, or they might they might not own their house. They might be a renter, and they might want to to uh, in, enjoy solar. So uh, and Kevin Schulte will be aware of this, of course. There are there's a community solar approach. So developers can build a solar array and sell that energy to uh, to residents, right? The array is located elsewhere from their house, and they're able to buy into that array. Um, that uh, that's that is gaining some traction in in the state and in the area, um, but it, it's now apparent that that can be coupled with CCA. And the CCA order, incidentally, did talk about this, but all of the the provisions weren't really in place to make this to make it uh, uh, work at the time. Um, However, some communities have, have really uh, uh, persevered and put this in place. For instance, the town of Geneva has, has done this. The town of Geneva adopted a, a community um, uh, solar program, and they actively went out, the members of the town board went out and talked to, member, to people in the community and got them to sign up as part of the customer acquisition effort that the developers usually take on. And they were able to get an adequate number of people to sign up to trigger a, um, a payment from the developer that, they were, that we were working with with them uh, to help the town with some other, um, some other projects that they wanted to work on. Well, now um, we're the, the downside to that approach is that customers get two bills then, right? They get their electric bill and it shows some credits on it from their participation in the community solar, and then they get a bill from the developer to cover the cost of those, uh, the cost of those credits. They usually save about eight to ten percent on their bill overall. Um, but if we couple community solar with um, with CCA. And if we could wipe out that second bill so that it all shows up on one bill, then not only will uh, those customers that don't care be able to b get solar energy and, and credits from a community solar program, but those customers that do care that can't put solar on the roof, they could also participate. And um, the municipalities don't have to, the municipalities that have tried to put this in place, they don't have to, to worry about doing the customer acquisition and they don't have to worry about customers who have taken no action suddenly getting two bills, which is a no, non-starter for most municipalities and we certainly understand why that is. So we see this coming there uh, that's in underway at the Public Service Commission to, to implement the mechanisms needed so that they only get one bill and then the municipality can use the opt-out treatment associated with community choice aggregation or whatever more sexy name we come up with yeah. um, to, uh, to, to be participating in those programs as well. And I think that gets to um, a bit anyway to Kevin Schulte's uh, notion about why not also make it 
local. And that's a move toward more locally generated um, renewable energy. So and, I've got, a, I've got uh, a new program name. What's not to like? Yeah. You know, <laughs> L- lower prices and 100% renewable. What's not to like? I'm, I'm, I'm building on that and, and just <laughs> one final point about putting community choice uh, aggregation and community solar together is that customers can benefit from, the, f- from both components fully. So they get if we're if we're able to negotiate a slightly reduced rate on their supply uh, from from the ESCO, they will realize that savings. And if they save eight to ten percent from participation in the community solar, they get the full benefit of that program as well at the same time. Uh, Kevin, what's not to like? What's not to like? Kevin, what's not to like? <laughs> Kevin follows up to say, by the way, there is absolutely no guarantee that CCA forces solar onto your electric bill or wind. The town laws need to require it. Al? Uh, yeah, the, the contracts with the, admin, the administrator contracts are written that way. The, re- the request for proposals go out saying we want 100% renewable. So it's written into all of the, the uh, legal documents in the town. Yeah, there are several ways to make that happen. One is that the town might require that it be 100% renewable. Um, and, and one is that, that the negotiation with the supply company requires it. And presumably, you'd want both of those things to happen, but either one would be, would be sufficient. Uh, I'm going to get Sarah's question for our guests after our only break of the hour. I've got Sarah and listeners, as we talk about um, community choice aggregations, we talk about your energy needs and where it comes from, what it costs. You know, one of the ideas is if this kind of change happens, if there's community choice aggregation, whether it's in Penfield or wherever you live, if that happens, what does it actually mean for residents? Is it really going to cut your energy bill? If so, how much? What's, what's realistic? How much are you actually looking at that bill? I'm very curious to know. And how much do you care about where it comes from? Are you sort of finding yourself more engaged, as people like Al and Megan are finding in, in Penfield, with more residents showing up for meetings and demanding this? So we're, we're covering what this all means in your town, whether it's happening now like it is in Penfield or these kind of conversations happen in the future, as we're seeing across New York State and the country. Uh, our guests are here from uh, the not only the Rochester People's Climate Coalition and Rocktricity, that's Ben Freevert, but Megan Meyer and Al Hibner are here from the Penfield CCA Residents Committee. Let's get that break and we'll come back to your comments and questions next. This is Connections. I'm Evan Dawson. Um, let me ask, I want to ask Al and Megan as they work on what they're working on in Penfield. What's the most common question you're getting from, from residents when you talk to people, Megan? Um, well, I, we are still, if, if I uh, go up to a new um, uh, resident in our community, I'm still trying to explain what CCA is to them. But then when uh, they realize what it is, they, you know, they, as, as most of us, it's it's a no brainer, you know. It's it's something that um, they would like to see happening in their community, and because um, it's good for the environment, and it's also um, lowering their rates with the bulk purchase program. You find them easy to persuade with some time. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, yes. <laughs> Al, what's the most common question you're getting? With them, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? And there's a lot in it for you. So that's what I, we try to answer. I, I dissect my bill very carefully. And, you know, I look at where we're going in the future as well. So really, what's in it for me? And we are able to convince people pretty well. Um, Let me get Jose and Webster on the phone next. Go ahead, Jose. Yes, uh, Mr. Dawson. Last year, when uh, you had a show, I believe, talking about the same issue with our G&E, and I heard it said that uh, the state of New York guarantees uh, profits for RGME of 11% a year, and that uh, if those profits do not rise to that level, that uh, the state kicks in the rest. Now, I've never heard, and I'm already very, very upset with RGME. okay? I tried switching at, at Walmart here. They, they've been having... I haven't seen them lately, but they've been having a couple of young people trying to sign people out for NRG, which is based in uh, Philadelphia. And they would be providing the, uh, the uh, energy. Always, RGME provides the service, and that's the most expensive of, the, of any, you know. So uh, I just, I'm, I'm outraged. 
I was living down in, in San Antonio, Texas, which is a municipal owned, municipality owned uh, energy provider. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, I never had any issues with them. But ever since I moved up here in 2018, I, uh, to be with a couple of grandchildren that I have, that uh, I never ever agreed, and I, I've even been at the, they threatened to cut my, uh, my service a couple of times, because, <clears throat> you know, we cannot agree on the, what they're charging me. Do so, you understand? Yeah, sure. Let me turn it over to our guest, Jose. Thank you for the phone call. Uh, ben, Al, uh, Megan, you want to jump in there? Go ahead, Ben. Uh, well, I, I guess I, I, I sense a, a fair amount of frustration with RG&E from Jose, and I, I don't know that uh, CCA is going to be able to do much about that. That that relationship uh, for delivery is going to remain the same, um, and, and I don't think that uh, that CCA uh, r really impacts. Uh, RG&E on the supply side either they you know they just go to the market to buy the electricity anyway so he's at, think he, he's implying that the the state guarantees profits for RG&E to a certain level it's my understanding that that is true. I don't know the exact level. He mentioned 11%. I had heard 10%. My my information may be may be out of date and there's as with anything, there's a little bit of controversy around what exact you know how much of that actually ends up being profit because of of some of their operations. But, but do you do you view that as subsidization of our genie by the state? Um, well, that's how he described. Yeah, it. Yeah, I don't. So we're talking about a, we're talking about company utilities that are natural monopolies. I, I'm not an economist, and I'm not prepared probably to def, to, to jump in and de determine how it is that natural monopolies should be regulated and how much money they should make, but. I, I think, I, I think the undertone of his call is that the relationship between the state and RG&E or the utilities is going to make these kinds of changes to our energy future more difficult, more cumbersome because people well, people are not going to want to seed the turf that they have. Yeah, well, I think I think he's right there. I think that, and and I think if you watch the dynamic between the Public Service Commission and the utilities, that that's what you see. The the Public Service Commission appears to me to be putting programs and policies in place that help us move toward that push toward um, renewable energy, and the utilities, in my view, again, um, appear to appear to in action anyway be resistant to to moving very quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sarah writes the following to us on Twitter. She says, I'm a solar panel owner. Thanks, GreenSpark. Of course. <laughs> we love you, Schultes. But in the winter, Sarah says, uh, the solar does not cover our use. Can CCA users also have solar panels on their house? She goes on to say, I thought when we got our panels, they said we couldn't do that or an ESCO. But maybe I'm remembering that wrong. Ben? Yeah, so so thus, thus far under CCA, we've kind of talked about two programs. The basic CCA model, which is aggregate the usage and go to the market, mm -hmm. and the community solar. So there's two different elements here. Um, th those customers that have solar on their roof can participate in the first one. They can be part of the CCA. And so the supply that, that they need that's beyond what their solar panels provide can come through the CCA and be 100% renewably generated. However, they cannot participate at the same time in a community solar program. Okay. Sarah, good luck. Uh, I appreciate that. Let me get Hal in Dansville next. Go ahead, Hal. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for the program. It's very informative. I've uh, <clears throat> been an advocate of renewable energy, uh, and uh, there's a relationship between solar and wind in terms of its availability. So uh, ideally, we would be speaking about both plus storage and transmission. So not to make a long story of this, uh, one of the things that just struck me recently was uh, – the Morris Ridge Solar Project, just down 390 from Rochester, is developing 177 megawatts of solar on 1,000 acres right around Mar Mount Morris, near the Mount Morris Dam. And the reason why is that there's a 240 kW power line there. And, it, and then because I have a farm and I put in 10 kilowatts with a tiny fraction, and wondered why I couldn't put in more. They, they said it's because I don't have three-phase electric, and it costs a million dollars a mile to do that. So if you, where you are, that is in Monroe County, I'm in Livingston, uh, where you are, 
uh, you have east and west the huge uh, New York Power Authority, uh, you know, Niagara Hydro project lines, the high voltage lines going east and west. So just about anywhere's along there where you could tie in wind and solar that complement each other, it would be local, but it also would avoid the cost of the uh, transmission, which transmission is one of the biggest problems in uh, going 100% renewable. So what does your guest think of that? Okay, thank you. Hal, thank you. Ben? Well, there, there's a there's a bit of a, a rat's nest of information uh, that, that we could follow up with there. Um, so there's a difference between, first there's a difference between utility scale and commercial scale solar. Um, and of course, the the bigger the solar uh, project, the, 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 um, the more challenging the interconnection uh, problem can be. A bigger bigger solar project, of course, is going to need more, uh, you know, bigger bigger capacity to the project to get the energy back onto, onto the grid somewhere. And so those those utility scale projects like the, the Mount Morris one that he's mentioning, there's another one down there called the Horseshoe Project, and it's down in that area too. Those, those types of projects um, sell the electricity into the grid on, at wholesale prices, and they um, they a, a really key component to their location it has to do with where they can interconnect. Smaller projects, uh, commercial scale projects, two to five megawatts, that ballpark, it's a little easier because they're smaller projects, but they still have interconnection challenges regularly. Those are the size projects that we're looking for for community solar to incorporate into CCA programs. Now, 10 kilowatts, the uh, caller mentions 10 kilowatts, that's more of a residential uh, size solar, and sometimes those are on the ground. Typically, those are relatively easy to interconnect, but often they do need three phase, three phase, they could need three phase power. I think mine at my house is a little bit bigger than that, and we did not have, need three-phase. But I, I'm not an electrical engineer, so I can't tell you when, when that's necessary and when it's not. But All right, Hal, thank you for that. We're going to rip through some more questions from listeners, and then we're going to turn back in a moment to what's happening in Penfield. I'm curious to know what, uh, what Al and Megan are asking from the community next here, because that's not a done deal there. We're also going to talk Monroe Community Power in a moment. But on the train of listener questions, Jim in Rochester Evan, how will the forthcoming New York State offshore wind farm master plan affect our energy choices in New York State? Has the plan been approved in the next state budget to move it forward? Or is it a renewable energy option that will be sometime far off still? That's from Jim. I don't know where that is. I don't, have you heard? We haven't heard. I, I, don't think, I, I don't know if we in, the, in this room have an update. I'll see if intern MRA Stein can figure out where we are in regards to that question on where we are with the wind farm master plan, if but, that's been approved there, Jim. But there's an important point to be made relative to pl projects like that. So one of the questions we end up fielding frequently is, well, if all of these communities aggreg do, do aggregation and are pursuing 100% renewable energy, will there be enough out there? And uh, and projects like that, to the extent that they're able to move forward, can can address the needs of CCA programs and keep the, assuming they can get all through all their permitting and other challenges, can help to meet that demand. Yeah, Jim. So think of it this way: here, I have a friend in Kansas City who's a chocolate maker, and years ago, before Oprah was off the air for Oprah's Favorite Things show. She wanted to put his chocolates on Oprah's favorite things. And he realized, if this happens, I cannot, I will not be able to meet the demand. It will just, I mean, it's a great opportunity, but he actually had to pass it up. You don't want to be in a position where all of a sudden everyone wants CCA, all these communities want it, and you don't have a way to meet that need here. So I think what Ben's saying is this is a step in the direction of saying, if we're moving this way, we've got to have sources. Is that fair? Yeah, it's a chicken or egg problem, right? Mm -hmm. Do you do you build the do, do do you build the generation before there's the demand, and then there's the demand and it's not there, or do you try it the other way around and build the build the demand for renewable, and that sends the market to the uh, signal to the market and they build it. So, but that's the beauty of the aggregation. We have a much larger customer base. We have fifteen thousand households in Penfield that can benefit from this. Not one hundred and fifty, fifteen thousand. What has your supervisor said about this? At, at this point, uh, the supervisor is supportive and cautious and making sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and the right choice will be made. But we are making very substantial progress. It's, it's Tony, time. It's Tony, right? Yeah, Still Tony, Tony LaFountain. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. haven't talked to Tony in years, but yep. uh, if the supervisor is listening, Tony strikes me as a person who is 
a nuts and bolts small c conservative. He he wants fiscally sound decisions. Correct. And if you can convince him, my guess is you've got probably an ally there. So, right. Um, right. but it's about convincing people that it's going to make sense. And yes. I think, um, and and the argument from the guests this hour is is that it will. And it, that's what our committee is there to do is to make that argument and it, build the political will to make this happen. Anna called from Rochester, wanted to follow up off air, just said, uh, heard the term natural monopoly. I think you used that earlier. She says when she was younger, she thought all monopolies were bad. Uh, monopolies tend to cause some problems, yes, in the marketplace, and I think that's still a fair assumption. That's right. And, 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 and to the extent that we need the services that some of them provide, like electricity, right? There's, there's, I, I don't see a way to implement that without a natural monopoly in place. Because somebody has to own and maintain and operate the, mm -hmm. the grid network. So um, most states have taken this same approach. Put put in one system of wires, have, select you know who's going to manage it and, and regulate them as closely as we can. But you can't expect somebody to step up to the plate to do that work and not get some sort of profit. Our friend James Gilbert from WROC-TV, who does outstanding reporting on these kinds of issues, sends just a note to us online and our friends from... Uh, from Parenton can help. He says, I'm moving, uh, I should say from Penfield, he says, I'm moving to Parenton next next month near a Roll Road. Is there a boundary for this CCA? How far does it extend? And what about Fairport Electric? How far would it extend here? Al, Megan, in terms of the CCA in Penfield. It's just Penfield just at this point Penfield. in time, unless we join with other municipalities like Pittsford, Arondequoit, and Brighton, which we are seeking to do. Okay. So yeah, yeah. Residents have to be. If you want to be involved in this, your community has mm -hmm. to the, it has to join. Yeah. Okay. So if you're near A Rot A Rolt Road in Parenton, is there a CCA there? There is not. However, we have heard some uh, some rumblings in, in Parenton that there is an interest. So. <laughs> And that's the way these. That's the way all the municipalities. It seems to come about. There's we we understand that there's an interest. We generally try to go and explain to to them what CCA is and help educate them and help answer their questions, uh, and we're happy to do that. And and if they you know if they um, become interested in it and realize that it's a it's a it's a no brainer, then uh, they generally try to move forward. And there's a lot happening at the local level, uh, James. As you know, I mean, we're having a conversation with local villages on Thursday at 1 p.m. Adopting solar. We're talking about Brockport, Lima, Sodus Point, making the switch to solar, putting an emphasis there. So this is all part of the community conversations. And it sounds to me like what they're finding in Penfield is what they found in Arondequoit, Brighton, Pittsford, which is people are more engaged. Sometimes it takes an Alan and a Megan to kind of go door to door and, and talk to people about it, but there's more engagement. I mean, wh what are we seeing with CCA in Monroe County outside of Penfield, Ben? Well, as you mentioned, of course, uh, Pittsford, both town and village, have passed the local law and selected a, an administrator. Um, the towns of Brighton and Arondequit have done the same. And those four communities are really working closely together. Uh, to, to move forward. They've all selected an administrator, and I guess uh, full disclosure here, uh, Rocktricity is part of that administrator team. We are partnered with another company to provide those administration services, and our, our job is to educate people about, educate the public about C CCA, what it is, how it impacts them. So is that off the ground yet there? Uh, they're, they're signing, they're supposed to be signing contracts as we speak, but uh, it feels to me like I've been saying that maybe for a week or two. You know, there's okay. a lot of back and forth. But you're lawyers. close. We're very close, and that's going to happen. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, beyond, uh, uh, Henrietta has expressed some interest, and we're we're trying to to nurture that a bit. Um, beyond um, uh, Monroe County, where we also have Victor is uh, the the village of Victor has has is, is down the track here. And the reason I point that out, the village of Victor and the city of Canandaigua, and the reason I point those out is they're in our G and E territory, so we could aggregate them with with uh, Pittsford, around Equate, Brighton and potentially Penfield. So they just have to be in the same uh, utility service territory in order for us to aggregate them together. Now, how much do you think Penfield can benefit watching this happen in other places? I mean, how much do you find it instructive and helpful that Penfield wouldn't be the first? I think that we've heard from Tony LaFountain, the supervisor, that he always prefers not to be first, but to be uh, coming along and do it and do it better, do it best, benefit from that knowledge. To learn from so what others are doing. To learn from sure, the others. That, that is his MO, as it were, in, in terms of implementing this type of policy. So the answer is yes. 
how much do you think uh, think residents when they're asking you the questions they're asking? Does this impact me? Do I still get the lights turned on? Do I have to put solar panels on my house? Of course, the answer to that is no, as we found out. But how much do you think, Megan? It's easier to sell it when others have already done it. Um, I think it's much easier to sell it when others have done it because uh, the publicity is out there. People um, um, connect with their residents from other towns and they hear about it. So, um, yeah, it's going to be easier for us, I think, one, down the road. And I got an email following up from James Gilbert. I forgot he mentioned Fairport Electric and Mark emailed separately to say, what is Fairport Electric? It's like some urban legend where all of the energy cost is lower just for for people in Fairport, is that a CCA? It's magic. It's not. It's not magic, <laughs> and I don't think it's a CCA. Why is Fairport Electric so much cheaper? Mark wants to know. What do you think, Ben? Well, I'll take my best shot at it. I don't know a lot of the details, <laughs> but but it is a um, uh, it, it, it's a municipal uh, utility, and it uh, they have an, a, a, a legacy contract to purchase electricity, and I think it's hydroelectric, uh, and that legacy co- contract provides them a certain amount of electricity every year for the community at a at a really good price. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's the extent of my knowledge. And James it. Gilbert, I don't know if you're in the boundary or not. I, I, I'm, that's not my expertise. Al, you want to add to that? There's an 800 pound gorilla in the room here that we haven't talked about, which is the other hat I wear is Citizens Climate Lobby carbon pricing. A price on carbon is coming. It is inevitable. It it has to be uh, coming. And when pricing on carbon occurs, the amount that we pay for electricity generated by fossil fuels will increase, just as gasoline prices will increase. And what's happening with CCA is we can insulate if we apply it and if we uh, implement it and get it to uh, utilize 100% renewable. We are actually holding harmless uh, making our insulating our residents from higher prices down the road. This is many years down the road. So that needs to be addressed and thought about because it's coming. And I know that from uh, my work with Citizens Climate Lobby over the past three years. The reason I think, Al, that you feel confident that it's coming is not because of the makeup of the federal government currently, but just for the reality of climate change yes. and the reality of what any society would have yes. to do yes. to make changes to behavior and consumption. Yes. The first you best just, you thing, find that inevitable. The first best thing that Congress can do is to cre- uh, implement a revenue-neutral carbon price. Okay. Um, so I want to ask both of you what you'd like to see happen in Penfield. What do you want to see people do next? What are you asking the community to do? Um, I think um, we would like to see, um, uh, probably we will be rolling out some educational programs for our community so that, um, you know, our community, more of our residents know what it's all about um, once the legislation is passed. And we're uh, very willing to work with the town on that um, aspect of um, the programs. And, And we want to help them to not reflexively opt out. This is an opt-out program, but some people who are concerned about government, as Ben mentioned earlier, may just reflexively opt out of the program. We want to provide them with the information to stay in it and also to add uh, opt-in to the community solar program for even more savings. So we have an educative function to provide with our committee, and we are committed to doing that. And Ben, when people hear Monroe Community Power, again, you're hearing all kinds of sort of different acronyms and, and efforts. What's going on with Monroe Community Power? Well, Monroe Community Power is is um, those four communities that we mentioned earlier, uh, Pittsburgh Town and Village and uh, Town of Rondequate and Town of Brighton. That's those four communities working together. Can and that grow and, and can it grab onto other communities as it grows or is it going to be limited in that way? Well, that depends. We, we, you know, that that's, would be up to those communities' uh, decision-making process in terms of them just, uh, you know, formally joining Monroe community power. But uh, if communities like Penfield put CCA in place and want want to join that aggregation, we can certainly do that from the standpoint of going to the market marketplace to purchase supply, to try to get the same kinds of terms. And, and that's one of our yeah. asks as a committee is to seek to join Monroe Community Power. It's, it's close. It's next door. Mm-hmm. It's people we know. It's communities we know. Why? More leverage? More leverage. It's from 55 to 70,000 households. Yeah. It's more it's, leverage. Yeah, it's good for, it would be good for Penfield to do that, and I believe it would be good for the other the communities. I just simply can't. I just simply can't speak for the other communities. Sure. If, if, yeah. I take the point. Correct. Ninety seconds or so here as we close here. What I find interesting is when you talk about these communities. Tony LaFountain is a Republican. You've got Republican leadership in 
Pittsford. You, you've got a mix of political leadership. And I guess what I'm saying is when we talk about this energy future and the decisions towns are making, you cannot just look at the political leadership of a board or a supervisor's office and then guess what they're going to do here. This is not a left-right issue, from what I can tell. Ben? I, I, I agree with that. I, I mean, we talk to a lot of um, communities uh, with Republican leadership, and and they see the, that, that climate change is a problem and that it's coming. And, and Often there's a uh, there's pressure coming from people in the community, and that that you know they listen to that, and so they also listen to we're, fiscal incentives. Well, well, they do. In this case, we're able to we're able to uh, save people money at the same time we're getting them 100 percent renewable energy. Yeah. The, the holy grail of climate action is to have uh, people involved in nonpartisan issues to make this a bridge issue not a wedge issue and that's what's happening in 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 penfield and i'm just extremely excited that penfield is able to disembark from the hyper partisanship and look at it from financial and sustainability issues really glad about that megan have you found it to be partisan at all uh, no, we have had um, you know great response from from people from all pol- political persuasions. So I think it's it's more of a human issue. Um, this whole climate crisis that we're going through, um, it's it's not one you know one uh, Republican Democrat mm-hmm. kind of thing. You know, it's really and and especially um, those of us who are thinking beyond our own lifetime to the future of our children and grandchildren. I think it's very important to um, think beyond ourselves in this issue. Later this month, we're having a conversation on exactly that. Our ability, our capacity to think beyond our own lifetimes and the work that we're doing here and what it impacts in the future. It's a profound idea. Uh, We'll also, uh, WXXI News, keep you updated to what happens in Penfield, uh, whether this goes forward or not. And uh, Megan and Al from Penfield, thanks for keeping us up to date. Thanks for Thank you here. so much for having us they're today. From, uh, they're from the Penfield CCA Residence Committee and Ben Freevert from Rocktricity. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Pleasure to be here. Our thanks to Emory Stein, the intern, and Bob volunteering, Rob Braden, the engineer, Megan Mack, producer. I'm Evan Dawson. We'll talk to you tomorrow.